Today's case is yet another reminder of that if you are rich enough, you may be able to get away with murder. My name is Sophia Talley, and this is True Crime In It. So today I am sipping some white wine that I put a little bit of freezer jam in the bottom of it. It looks gross. It tastes amazing. And then I am still knitting my sock that I've been knitting for the past like I want to say like five episodes. So pretty much all season and I exclusively knit this while I record. So I haven't really made much progress on it but it is one of my favorite things to knit while I research and while I record episodes because then I it I don't have to worry too much. You know what I mean? I can just knit stockinette with a little motif in the front and it's super relaxing and easy and excuse my cat's tail. She's refusing to budge in normal cat fashion, but the show must go on and let's get on to the case. The beautiful and intelligent Rebecca Maui Zahau was born on March 15th, 1979 in what is modern day Myanmar, but back then it was called Burma. When she was young, her family moved around quite a bit. They first immigrated into Nepal, and then they lived in Germany until finally settling in the United States when she was only 10 years old. Rebecca came from quite a large family, as in she had tons of brothers and sisters, and she was a really bright, friendly, vivacious girl. In 2002, she married nursing student Neil Nelapa, and she worked in the medical field as as well. She was an ophthalmologist technician and so it was her job to do your like initial eye test before you saw the doctor so she was the one blasting that air into your eye you know what I'm talking about also apologies for my son he is too and he is refusing to nap and I really hope you guys can't hear him unfortunately Rebecca's marriage did not last long in 2008 she actually began Began dating Jonah Shack Nye, who was a very exceptional man. And while they were dating, she was still technically married. The divorce actually took years. But Jonah Shack Nye was the founder and CEO of Medicis Pharmaceutical. And now Jonah is like Rich Rich. He was voted the ninth most highly paid CEO in Arizona with a annual income of 6.4 million in 2010 and his company Medicis Pharmaceutical I hope I'm saying it correctly because it's spelt so strangely to me had made hundreds of millions because they developed a Botox alternative called Restylane and if you are a Botox user you most certainly have heard of this like it is a big deal in the world of cosmetic surgery alterations. Now, when Rebecca met Jonah, he was already a father of three, married twice. He had two children with his first marriage to Kimberly Janes. And this first marriage ended in a three-year-long custody battle over their children. It was a very, very messy breakup. He then married Dina Shacknai, and they had a son named Maxfield Aaron Shacknai. And unfortunately, this marriage also ended in a very, very messy divorce with allegations of physical and 
emotional and verbal abuse happening on both sides. What I read about their fights was not good. Police were called on several occasions. Usually they were called off before they got there. Jonah's finger was broken while he was being choked. She was worried that he was going to hurt her. In fact, she is quoted as saying, I was scared of what he is capable of doing to me, end quote. So it was just an awful, violent relationship. And I just feel awful for Max, who was growing up through this time. And his parents broke up when he was around eight years old. So Jonah, to me, just sounds undesirable all the way around when it comes to his love life. But after his marriage ended, Jonah spent his life split between Phoenix, Arizona, and the San Diego area, specifically the town of Coronado. And this is where he owned this famed Spreckled Mansion Beach House. Now, this mansion was originally built in 1910 by John D. Spreckles, and it was a wedding present to his son, Klaus, and his new wife, Ellis. Often, the beach house is confused with the Spreckles Mansion, which was built in 1908, and the Spreckles Mansion was much bigger and much more ornate with like a marble staircase and like leather railings on this staircase and beautiful gardens. It was even designed to withstand California's earthquakes. So a lot of the times when this story is being told, it's often being told as if it's taken place on the Spreckled Mansion's property when really it's taken place on the beach house. And I am 99.9% sure of that. So I just found that really interesting. And the beach house, though it's a beach house, is a mansion in its own right. Also interesting, the original builder, John D. Spreckles, is a very important figure to San Diego history. He is eulogized as being one of America's few great empire builders who invested millions to turn a struggling, bankrupt village into the beautiful and cosmopolitan city San Diego is today. So let's fast forward about 100 or so years to July 11, 2011. Rebecca and her 13-year-old sister, Zena, and... Jonah's son, Max, were at the mansion just hanging out and just enjoying their summer. Rebecca was taking a shower on the second floor when she heard a either she couldn't tell what exactly she heard. It was either a dog barking or a loud crash. And she she was in the bathroom and she immediately darted out as soon as she could only to find Max lying at the bottom of the stairs with his razor scooter on his leg, a few soccer balls around him, and the large ornate chandelier broken next to him. And when Rebecca found Max, he was still conscious, and he was able to tell her one word, ocean. Ocean was the name of Rebecca's dog. And that was the only thing that he was able to say before falling unconscious. Rebecca screamed for her sister to dial 911. And she also called Jonah in a panic. He barely understood what she was screaming about when she called. She was so freaked out, so concerned. And he didn't quite understand what happened until he made it to the house. At the time, Jonah, by the way, was only like a couple of miles away at most at the local gym. So he wasn't too far at all. And he actually got there around the same time that paramedics and police got there. When police gets there, Rebecca is just in shock and distress. But she kept saying one thing over and over again. And that was, Dina is going to kill me. Dina, remember, is Max's biological mother, also Jonas's second wife. And Dina was just allegedly really mean to to Rebecca. You know, like she never tried to be civil with her. 
and everyone knew this and it's kind of like and it just reminds me of the toxic relationship that Dina and Jonah had and just how even after the marriage she was still obviously dare I say I'm just guessing jealous of Rebecca despite this Rebecca worked really hard to serve the family any way that she possibly could during this tragic time when Max was rushed to the hospital they first assumed that he actually suffered a heart attack from his fall because he was having some like neurological issues but then doctors realized upon a closer examination that he suffered some spinal cord injuries that affected his breathing and so not enough oxygen was getting to Max's brain. Max spent the following day in the hospital fighting for his life. While Max was in the hospital, Rebecca was just frantically trying to help this family that was now in what I like to call the early grief process. Max was very much still alive, but it just was not looking good. And so his family was flying in to see him while he was in the hospital. And Rebecca was the one picking up family from the airport to take them to where they were staying and to shuttle them to the hospital, really doing a lot of legwork while Jonah sat by his son's side. Rebecca picked up Nina, who is Dina's twin sister, the ex-wife that hates her, and she also picked up Adam, who was Jonah's brother. That night, Rebecca, Jonah, Adam, and a friend actually went out to dinner at this downtown seafood spot. And you know, like when you're reading this, you're like, they went out for dinner, but there's nothing at this point that Jonah can do for his boy besides wait and when you have a loved one in the hospital you know they always recommend that you get out and get away for a little bit and it was just dinner so I just don't want to hear anyone be like they went out for dinner you know like you have to eat you might as well cling on to whatever normalcy that you have I remember when my son was in NICU he wasn't in critical condition by any means but I just remember all the doctors and nurses asking have you eaten today or asking asking my husband, have you done something for her today? And so it's just, you just have to remember that when people go through these tragedies, you are just clinging and clinging for normalcy. At the dinner, you know, the guys acted reportedly normal, but Rebecca barely touched her plate and was very quiet. Adam noted that she was just not acting herself, obviously. Also earlier, when she picked up Nina, Dina's sister from the airport, Nina was just felt like she was just acting so weird. She only met Rebecca once and already Rebecca was hugging her and saying, I'm so happy that you're here. And just just understandably in a very fragile state. I don't know why Nina thought that Rebecca was acting weird. To me, that whole interaction is very normal when you are mourning an accident. That night after dinner, Jonah went back to the hospital to sit by his son's bed with his ex-wife Dina and Rebecca and Adam returned back to the Spreckle Mansion beach house. Rebecca was staying inside. She had a room at the mansion and Adam had agreed to stay at the beach house. Why? I don't know. There was enough bedrooms for him I don't know if that's just what rich people do with their guests, put them in a whole different house. But I found that a little bit like mm -mm, weird. You know what I mean? Maybe it's just weird because it's out of my tax bracket. I don't know. That night, neighbors heard something fishy. First, neighbors heard really loud music, almost as if a party was happening at Spreckles Mansion, which is really insane because everyone in the neighborhood knew of the accident at this point. Also, a neighbor two doors down actually heard a woman screaming and crying for help that night. But this neighbor did not do anything about it. And I just want to say, please, guys, you know, it's almost human instinct to just mind your own business. In fact, it is. But if you hear someone crying for help, please, please just call the police, even if you're unsure, because Nine times out of 10, it could be a fluke, but you never know that one time could save someone's life. But despite all this noise, no one called the police. 
that next morning on July 12, 2011, at around 6.45 a.m., Adam left the pool house to go get a cup of coffee from the main house. And on his way to the main house, he made an awful discovery. He found Rebecca's body hanging from a red rope suspended from her bedroom balcony. Her hands were tied behind her back and her ankles were also tied together. Her body was nude and she was obviously very deceased. At exactly 6.48, he dialed 911 saying, I got a girl hung herself. Same place you got the kid yesterday. And I'm going to end today's story there. Look out for the second half next Sunday night. And we're going to find out if it was a suicide as Adam suggested, or something much more sinister. My name is Sophia Talley, and this is True Crime In It. For more information, including show notes, please visit www.thedrunkleader.com slash true crime. Stay safe.